Everyone, welcome back to the Capital Mindset Show. Today, we're going to be discussing what has happened. So if you guys have seen the community post, you guys already know what I'm going to talk about. Well, the first order of business is getting to talk about the specifics of this Voyager bankruptcy. Okay, so Voyager Digital has been a company that we have discussed quite some time on this channel, uh, not in a positive light for the most part, you could say. I mean, you guys be the judge of that. You guys can comment down below. Have I been positive about it or negative? And I think the answer is quite obvious. Now, if we look at the actual uh, chart here, we see that it's no longer trading or no data, and it's actually be pending the listing from the Canadian Stock Exchange. Uh, so we'll go over basically what you guys have to understand, but I kind of summarized it in layman's terms uh, last night as it happened, or more like this morning, very early morning last night. Uh, if you guys were awake, I know for my European audience, you guys were just waking up. So, but yes, so we, we do see that. And, you know, it's all over the news today. If you click on any of these articles, you can see, okay, well, what's going on? Uh, so we have Voyager Digital faces delisting from the Toronto Stock Exchange filing bankruptcy filing. So basically, they're filing Chapter 11 bankruptcy. In essence, what they're going to be doing is working with their lenders, and uh, the company itself won't go away. That's not necessarily what will occur. However, I just want to also kind of mention that you're not really necessarily covered under that FDIC insurance for a lot of their products. Okay, so if you thought that, and we did discuss that in the past, but if you knew the channel and you did think that, then whoever you listened to about it, you were hearing perhaps, you know, they were mistaken or they were misleading you. I don't know to the severity of it. I just know that you're not necessarily covered because it's not a banking instrument. Actually, Voyager Digital used a bank that had FDIC insurance, but uh, they themselves were not FDIC insured or their products were not FDIC insured. And a lot of the products yielding nine, eight, ten, whatever percentage it was, those are not protected under that same insurance. And by the way, the onus would be on you, the user, to do your own research on that if you're gonna put your money with that. Um, and also for those who were promoting this company in the form of their products or th their stock, but I'm gonna focus mainly on their products because I did receive comments on the last video saying, well, you know, it's their money, uh, it's people's responsibility. I'm not referring to that mostly in the complaints. It's mainly my, my biggest issue, my largest issue is the sponsorship part and not kind of addressing a lot of the major risks. Okay, because if you take on that sponsorship, I would hope that more on a moral standpoint, you should be addressing and hammering the risks associated with a product. Similar to how a banker would sit you down and tell you, okay, well, these are the products that our bank offers and these are the risks. This is not insured, this is insured, et cetera, vice versa. So uh, that should be something that a content creator on a moral standpoint has or should um, not be required legally. But you know what I mean by that. You, they, almost like you should go out of your way to do that for your audience, okay? If you wanna feel good and sleep good at night, okay? Uh, all well and good, uh, so the company is gonna go bankrupt, so we're going to uh, you know, put this behind us and kinda discuss again what the heck happened. So uh, something that you should know about this company, and we can use a free resource here with CNBC, Crypto World, but eh, you almost kinda <laughs> gag there. Uh, but Crypto Hedge Fund, uh, Three Arrow Capital plunges into liquidation as market crash uh, takes toll. So why Three Arrow Capital? You've already heard this from other creators, but this is the cause of it at the end of the day. Three Arrow Capital, they were lent money and Three Arrow Capital did whatever it is they did with it. And they lost it all essentially uh, because they weren't actually hedging themselves properly and anticipating volatility because crypto only goes up. So under that same philosophy, they acted upon that philosophy in such a manner that they basically just lost it all. And they're unable to pay back their debts in order in, to Voyager Digital, who then also is insolvent, right? And so this is, again, what we talked about. And I'll, I'll just highlight it once more in the actual video when we did about Voyager that's over an hour long. That is something that we did discuss. That is actually the biggest risk that I addressed with this and I received comments on it. So I applaud you guys who did see the full video and then commented in counterpoints. At the very least, you saw the, you saw the video because it was towards, I guess, more middle end, closer to the end. So if you were, you know, commenting in the comment section to say why I'm wrong about that, that does show that, you know, you definitely don't have a low attention span. You're able to watch a very long video and then make those points. So kudos to you. Uh, now what we're going to say or what I'm going to say here is again, and I've already made another video about this because we were, we've been talking about this over and over and over again, how the potential for uh, their liquidity and, and why they're more likely to go bankrupt than not now. Well, now let's dispel that, you know, they are going bankrupt now. And yes, it was that counterparty risk at the end of the day. When you look at bank-like institutions, you know, even, I mean, banks, Banks and bank-like institutions like Voyager Digital, let's say Coinbase, for example, or any of these other ones that are trying to do something, you know, bank-like, 
it, you always have to pay attention to counterparty risk. You cannot not pay attention to that. And even I'd address Citigroup. Citigroup, a very well-established bank at this point in time, has a lot of counterparty risk, especially in other nations, such as Russia, for example. They don't have exact direct risk, but they have a lot of counterparty risk. So a lot of the parties that they do deal with uh, do have some exposure. And let me just mute that so we don't get that again. Uh, they do have that exposure. And so, you know, almost by proxy of uh, association, right, you have that risk in your balance sheet. And so Voyager Digital, I like I said in that video, they don't have to necessarily default on anything. It's the parties that they deal with. And I tried to dispel that or kind of explain it, sorry for lack of a better term, explain it in layman's terms by using, you know, let's say I, I, we have a transaction, you're investing in me and then I'm transacting with Joe over there. Well, Joe, you know, you don't know Joe, but you know me. You look at me and I'm, I'm a stand-up fellow, okay? I'm not gonna do anything funny with the money. I'm gonna do what I need to do with it. And I lend it to Joe, but Joe is not a stand-up fellow and he, you know, goes out gambling at night. Well, I am at risk of Joe and by proxy, you're at risk of because of Joe, okay? So Joe is that counterparty risk. That's a simple way of kind of explaining it. You can do all the homework with me, but then you're not paying attention to what I'm, or my transactions with Joe, and then you should have been paying attention to Joe, for example. And we actually broke down a lot of the entities that they do deal with, a lot of them, you know, with interesting jurisdictions like the Cayman Islands. So, you know, the Cayman Islands has a reputation for a reason because there's a lot of loosely, uh, you could say, laws protecting more so the business rather than the shareholder. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> that was some of the jurisdictions that, you know, were kind of funny because uh, of the stereotypes behind them. But in all seriousness, that was the biggest risk, the counterparty risk. And that's what did them. That's what did them under. So now the company is gone and we might not have to talk about it ever again. I mean, the company will still exist. Their services will probably still remain open for a while. Uh, the question then becomes, how can they negotiate themselves out of this? Okay. And kind of some uh, food for thought and, and to remind everyone some of the issues surrounding this company. Well, when some people were promoting the stock, they were highlighting, okay, well, the CEO, where does he come from? He comes from E-Trade. Okay. Is that necessarily a good thing? Is that really the bull case? Is that really where you're going with that? And that was actually used a lot. Believe it or not, that was used a lot. I mean, you were talking from large YouTube channels, smaller YouTube channels. A lot of people were just highlighting the fact that this guy had some some experience and you know well, well with that let's kind of brought it down to credentials so because credentials therefore this is a good company therefore it's a well-run company no that's in and of itself argument from authority uh, we want to actually observe the actions taken by that individual observe the actions taken by the company and from there make our judgments not say uh, this person has this experience therefore equals success no, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of failures if that's the case. All right, and then the next topic of this video is something that I had requested by uh, some subscribers, and it's to take a honest and open-minded view on Arc. Okay, so we're gonna actually do that here, and we're gonna pull up the actual stock uh, ticker for Arc, and we're gonna go off of the base fund RK. Okay, so RK, so Arc Innovation. and so I'm gonna take it with an open mind, just like I uh, that was asked by the subscriber. Remember, you guys drive the content. And so with that being said, we're looking at ARK Innovation. ARK Innovation over the past five years has now underperformed the S&P 500. So it should be noted because for a while, a lot of people, and I'll actually show you guys here. So if I pull up the SPY, uh, we can see against the S&P 500, it has now underperformed the broader market. With the S&P 500 is actually up 58.87%. ARK Innovation is up 54.79%. And on a risk adjusted basis, that this is even worse. So if you actually compare the two sharp ratios, uh, you're going to get a far underperformance according with with uh, Arc Innovation. Okay, so uh, on a risk adjusted basis, it looks even worse. Just want to highlight that. But something to note: if you actually kind of pull through in terms of the year, you're going to see. Okay, well the two are vastly different. With the SP 500 only down 11%, while Arc Innovation is down 65.24%. So Arc Innovation within it has many volatile assets, and we're going to actually take a look at each company one by one and kind of share my thoughts here on some of them. Some of them I've done videos in the past and you can kind of guess whether or not they were positive or negative at the time. Uh, but some of them I haven't done videos on and I can kind of share my thoughts as we go along. Now I have done reaction videos to ARK Innovation, some of their analysts in terms of what projections they've been making out into the future, almost solidified or ensure that I will never get hired by ARK Invest, even though they aren't close by, okay, so to speak. But let's go over to their website and figure out what it is that they're owning. 
Okay, so one thing I want to highlight before we go on is if you guys are new to the markets, you guys want to look at, and by the way, for the most part, and there's no hiding this, every time we talk about this, I want to address this, for the vast, 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 vast majority of people, you actually should find index funds, low-cost index funds that get you the exposure you desire in your given market. So there's so many different products out there for you to decide from. Uh, you know, depending on your goals, depending on what strategy you like to implement, there's one out there for you, I can guarantee you that. Now, one thing you want to pay attention to is the expense ratio. So if you look at the expense ratio here for ARK Invest, all of these funds will disclose their expense ratios to you. You can find them on their websites, on their prospectus, etc. Uh, you will be able to find that information on any of them. Okay, so if you go on Vanguard's website, BlackRock's website, State Street's website, ARK's website, you will be able to find their expense ratio. It should be very easy to find. So you can see here the expense ratio is 0.75. This is on the expensive side. Even though 0.75 doesn't seem like a lot, it actually is a decent chunk. So something like the SPY or other index funds by Vanguard are far lower at something like 0.08 or even lower than that. So um, when you look at something like 0.75, that eats away at your gains over long periods of time. Now, the marketing behind this fund is that you will out severely outperform the market, right? And that severely is the wrong word because that sounds like it's a bad thing, but substantially outperform the market over long periods of time. That's what she or, or Kathy Wood, she's a really good saleswoman, I guess, because I will define good saleswoman by the amount of capital she's able to get to go into her fund. So that's how I'll define it. Uh, but yeah, so she's been pretty good. At the end of the day, what she desires is the uh, assets under management to rise. And I've talked about that in the past. So I think, yeah, right here, we have about $8 billion in assets under management. So she generates the fees in this fund of 0.75 of that net asset base. And so she, as long as that asset base continues to rise to some degree, either by new investment or even by you know performance, we're doing pretty well, she'll do fine, her company will do fine. Now she's been around for quite some time. I've discussed some of the past things that she's been around. And remember, like I say to everyone, uh, everything you've done in the past is pretty much like still out there. If, if someone is uh, determined enough, they can find everything. So uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. And then so when we go down to the actual holdings here, we can actually see uh, some of the holdings uh, that I want to discuss, which is Zoom Video. So Zoom Video, I haven't done a, or maybe I have, I, I, I might have. I've done a, around 300 videos already, but in the content library, you should be able to find it if I have done one. And I, I really don't remember what I've stated, but it probably wasn't very positive. Now, Zoom Video makes up 10.16% of the portfolio. What I did notice and what I want to kind of comment on is that you know, there is a lot of commentary around innovation in this fund, but what I've noticed is there's a lot of interesting choices in terms of what is considered innovation, and, and some that, you know, are kind of predictable or make sense. So Zoom Communications, I don't quite understand the thesis behind that one because there's, it's a very competitive industry. Zoom Communications, you know, being the video share, I've used it many times in the past. In fact, when I still had my uh, tutoring business, that's actually one of the main ways to communicate across, you know, whatever geography. I was able to do that with my um, uh, various clients and it was able I was able to do you know like whiteboards because you know it was a lot of stem stuff so I, I needed to actually write out some math problems for them and it was good to draw out pictures if we were doing anything based in biology or anything like that uh, biochemistry uh, so that it was a good platform overall I do like it now there are a lot of other services that integrate the same uh, application but not zoom okay so uh, you know, we have uh, with WebEx, right? We have WebEx, we have uh, Microsoft Teams, we have a variety of other competitors kind of coming in and just adding an integration uh, for video conferencing. Video conferencing is not very difficult to really do. And Zoom Communications has had some issues with cybersecurity. Going down the list to Roku. Roku, I know I've done a video on it. And Roku, I was pretty negative on it. And subsequently, the company or the stock price has suffered substantially. It almost deserves an update video because of how much lower it is from when I talked about it. So, but Roku, um, you know, if I actually pull that video, because now I'm, I'm tempted to do that, let's let's go ahead and do that. So to kind of save you some time, there was a video posted on December 22nd. Uh, and uh, yeah, it didn't get many videos, views, or sorry, because the channel was pretty small. But if you're curious, you can go check it out. Uh, I'll kind of summarize some of the thoughts that I had at the time. And that was, yes, it was overvalued. Uh, Roku today stands at about, uh, if we actually take a look at the price, $88. So again, just to remind you, uh, we have 
uh, Roku sitting at $88. At the time, it was uh, $221. A lot of people were, you know, uh, not really a fan <laughs> of Roku or maybe our thoughts of Roku at the time should have more people seen it because it was a very popular stock. And ARK Invest would have definitely disagreed with our assessment at the time. But over time, I believe that, you know, time showed us to be correct on that assessment. And, you know, going back to Roku, I, I, I don't really see much of the innovation there. There were the rumors that Netflix might be interested in purchasing Roku for its advertising parts of the business. I think, for example, Roku has a lot of headwinds ahead of it in terms of competing against Amazon, Google, uh, so Chromecast, uh, Alexa, or, you know, Fire TV, sorry, not Alexa, but Fire TV, and then Alexa integration. But Roku in and of itself is a good platform. It has a kind of a cult-like following. It has its own content, but regarding its content, we did review it back then, and it, it it's kind of like not super interesting. Now, the next one is what she's really famous for, which is Tesla. This really put ARK Innovation on the map. So with Tesla and the investment in Tesla that performed so well, it actually was the best thing for her career. It made her very popular among the retail crowd, among, you know, institutional investors that go on TV a lot. They love to interview her and say, oh, look, you're so great. You're so smart. So she has really interesting price targets that we've covered in the past. And I didn't mean that to sound condescending, by the way. So I, I apologize. But uh, with Tesla, there it, it's sitting at 8.12 percent it used to be much larger percentage of the portfolio relative to the rest now you know zoom communications kind of overtaking that uh, she has some very interesting price targets in range of the, the thousands of uh, dollars per share and currently tesla's you know in the hundreds or six hundred dollars per share somewhere around there now crispr therapeutics that's another um you know high not high flying but very hyped up uh, technology play within biotechnology and that's with using CRISPR as a methodology for gene editing. And uh, this has interesting applications into the future, but there are limitations to it. So it, well, there are current limitations to CRISPR technology. Whether or not you know we overcome these limitations is actually what all these companies are trying to invest in and trying to improve upon into the future. But the technology itself for sure has a, a, a backbone. Now the question is, well, which one will win? CRISPR technology is one of many. CRISPR has a lot of advantages in terms of first mover advantages in some cases than others. But again, there's a lot of investment by a lot of companies into the space. There's no guarantee that CRISPR is going to win. So and then UiPath, Teladoc, so a lot of, you see this, Teladoc is another one that I don't really understand. UiPath, I can understand and I can get behind uh, for what they do. Uh, but Teladoc is one that I start to kind of say, okay, well, Kathy, I, I don't really know this one because uh, this one has a, you know, telemedicine. It's, it's, you know, what are the barriers to entry? Well, you probably would require some network effect of sorts. Uh, you know, that's what you're hoping for, that the company builds out this network and then consumers are more convenienced by entering that network and remaining within that network. But there's a lot of companies that I haven't really covered yet because, again, I'm trying to cover all the requests you guys have. But there's a company, I, I believe, by the name, and this is not an endorsement whatsoever of this company. In fact, the company is having its own struggles. But it's an example of a company that's trying to do almost like an integration of sorts, and that is a, a One Health. I know that Walgreens has their own, CVS has their own. So they're all kind of using some form of their own, or they're even using Teladoc. But the point is, the ability for a new company to kind of develop their own and try to do have an, a relationship uniquely with the client and not having to pay those fees to Teladoc is something that is a bit of a concern. So I need more of a moat. Now, my experience with Teladoc is that they purchased an old investment of mine, Livongo. I did very, very well with Livongo. I'm very happy with that investment. And they actually gift, not gifted me, but they paid me with some Teladoc shares. And subsequently, I sold the Teladoc share. So uh, that was uh, you know, my only exposure ever in the past to Teladoc shares. And I never wanted to own Teladoc shares, but I was happy that they purchased the investment that I had uh, which was Lavongo. You guys may not have even heard of that company, but you know, there you go. Uh, so then the other one, Exact Sciences Corp. So another one that's you know biotech. Block. I, I want to kind of skip over to Block because Block's one that people know. And then Twilio's the one I probably liked one of the most here actually. But Block I also like, but at the right price. They are a in the payment processing space. They are a gateway. Uh, in some ways, they're also an acquirer, but mainly a gateway is what you people know about them. And you know, they have the also Cash App, which is very popular fast-growing service, uh, similar to Venmo, you can kind of think of it that way, kind of helping the underbanked. I do think that there's going to be a lot of movement in that space, a lot of competition, so I would have to get it at the right price. So I, I kind of like that company overall, uh, but uh, I think it's of a higher quality, of a higher caliber than some of the other companies that we just looked at. Twilio, 
I, in my opinion, is one of the highest quality companies in on this list or in this index thus far in the top holdings. And uh, that's actually for me because Twilio has a lot of interesting parts to it. And uh, one thing that I like about Twilio is the ability or the potential for it to actually develop its own CDN networks and actually offer that up as a service. CDN networks have a huge array of tailwinds for the next 10 years. Now, the question then becomes for CDN networks, and you might have heard, you might be familiar, you might work in this industry. So I love your commentary down below because I'm not an expert in this industry. But from what I know, it does have a lot of unique features that an open network or instead of a closed network, an open network doesn't really have in terms of security. And this is very important as we kind of integrate more and more technology into various workflows, uh, as we integrate more machines into various workflows. So CDNs are going to become more and more important. And Twilio has the infrastructure to kind of uh, outlay that already. So it's something that would be almost like a natural transition for the company. So I, I, I like that one. All right. So that's pretty much RK. Uh, so we talked about, again, the Voyage Digital kind of breakdown and something that Again, I, I personally kind of say about ARK Invest and what I'll say about many of these stocks is in a liquidity boom, some of these stocks would do pretty well. And the liquidity crunches are exactly, most of these are the canaries in the coal mine that we've been talking about back in uh, uh, January. And actually, let, let's actually pull up uh, Roku because let's see when Roku really started to, to uh, get absolutely hammered. And that should be around one of the first times, like probably February of 20, yep, February 2021, we had the hiccup. And we've talked about that uh, in the bond market. So the little hiccup that we experienced in the bond market and uh, what happened in February, almost like follows that precisely. And then now the second hiccup was in October. And yeah, here we go. So October from there on, uh, we had a nice little drawdown there, but it doesn't follow it perfectly. But it, it kind of follows. There's a, there, if I mapped it out, there's a decent correlation between that. But from what I see, Roku was a beneficiary of the liquidity boom, and during the liquidity crunch, uh, definitely a loser and a canary in the coal mine. So not the only company. If I also pull up CRISPR, so see Chris uh, Burr, let's just put that, CRSP. Uh, if I actually pull up that five-year, it should follow a very similar trends. So yeah, around there, February. Yeah, February, drawdown, and then October... October, yeah, around there. So another one, uh, but CRISPR has done pretty well over the past five years. So the performance is still pretty well. It's it's beaten the index by a good margin, three hundred fifty seven percent versus around fifty something percent for the index. You know, not not too bad. Uh, let me let's actually check back on Roku because I actually want to confirm Roku's also done pretty well as well over the five years. It's up two hundred thirty three point two nine percent. So one of the things that has kind of harmed um, Kathy Wood's performance is actually the reshuffling effect. So as she kind of re uh, shuffles she's changed this portfolio over time and so she's kind of played with the soap so if she's probably held a lot of these to to the same weightings uh, she probably would have done decently well or perhaps even better if I, I don't know that for certain so let me actually check out um, some of the some of these other stocks so like zoom uh, video I think zoom video let's see over that five year so yeah, over that five year, it has outperformed the market. So she did, it, it's because of that reshuffling that she's been doing that actually probably harmed her performance. And she hasn't held all these stocks uh, throughout that time period. So a lot of these stocks, you know, she bought into at very high prices, at exuberant prices. She didn't have this massive portfolio, uh, or not this massive portfolio, but this exact portfolio allocation all the way through. If she had, she actually would have done probably better. Um, but yeah, and then there's also um, the fact that no. Well, all in all, let's just keep it at that. <laughs> uh, so that that's something that I find uh, interesting. In terms of geographical exposure, you're not really getting much. You're basically getting a massive concentration into North America, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but you know you don't really get that diversification. So uh, one thing I, I would say is that in terms of innovation, I, I don't know. I can see and I understand the arguments for a lot of these, but some of them I really don't understand. Again, like Zoom Communications, I don't understand. Roku, I don't really understand in terms of innovation. CRISPR, I get it. Tesla, I get it. Teladoc, don't understand. Um, exact Sciences, I can understand. Uh, UiPath, I can understand. Intellitherapeutics, I can I can understand that. Block, even Block, I can understand. Twilio, I can definitely understand. But some of these, I, I, I don't understand. And what I say I understand is that I get that people make the argument. I don't necessarily agree on every front, but I can see it. And I don't say, you know, well, you're completely arguing from, you know, up your rear or whatever, you know. So, yeah, that, that's pretty much my thoughts. Uh, I think that if we do return to some form of liquidity boom, uh, or 
as some people, funnily enough, call you know risk on. Uh, a lot of these stocks can experience you know some uh, better performance thus far, but who knows how much further they have to go or down. Okay, so uh, the the thing is that the liquidity crunch you don't really know exactly when the end is. Uh, well, the the bond market can kind of give us hints. But it's not exact. And for me, I'd just rather prefer to buy assets that I like at prices that I like and kind of just relax on that front. So that's pretty much my thoughts on the ARK Invest. I'm taking a serious approach, not kind of just uh, looking at it um, from, the, from the thing. So some of the, some of the companies, companies, not stocks, companies I like. So again, like I said, I'll, I like Twilio. Um, I like Block. I like, um, let me see this. I like Tesla as a company, but not the stock, okay? Let me, let me also say that. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the ones I, I like. I don't really like many of the other ones. UiPath, I, I, I can like that one. That one I, I like a little bit, all right? So, but a lot of those... You know, other ones, not not so much, not as much. Okay, and that's kind of my ending conclusion. So, all in all, um, you know, if you if you buy Arc Innovation here, I don't know, maybe maybe you actually uh, perform well, but uh, if you, you, in my opinion, it's going to be more on the the speculation. So, Arc Innovation, RKK, definitely not going to hire me, <laughs> and Voyager Digital. Uh, you know, we're turning that page. That page is is gone. All right, it's 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 probably gone. Market cap of 65 million Canadian dollars. Yeah. So, uh, with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.